Hey guys, um, this is going to be the homework assignment for uh, 14 through 16 of Unit 1. Um, this will be the last homework assignment for the unit. And we're just talking a lot about um, limits involving infinity. So basically we're talking about vertical and horizontal asymptotes. And then um, the intermediate value theorem. So starting with question 1. The function g is continuous at all x except x equals 4. And the, uh, if the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x is infinity, which of the following statements about g is true? So before I move on to that, it, so I know that the function g is continuous at all x except at x equals 4. So this could mean that at x equals 4, if it's not continuous, the types of discontinuity are, you know, jump, whole, or removable, right? And then, um, then you could have a, an asymptote. Um... Now, the next part tells us what sort of discontinuity it is because it says here that the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x is infinity. So uh, x equals 4 on both sides it has to be going up, right? And so there's an asymptote here, vertical asymptote at x equals 4. So knowing that, let's see what these are. So g of 4 is equal to infinity. And that can never be the case. You can't evaluate a function and get infinity out of it. There's no such thing as the function having a value of infinity because infinity is not a, it's not a number. It's not a value. Um, the line x equals 4 is a horizontal asymptote to the graph of g. x equals 4 is a vertical line. So it, that, that contradicts. x equals 4 is a vertical line, horizontal asymptote. Uh, that's a contradiction right there. Um, the line x equals 4 is a vertical asymptote. So yes, that's what we're looking for. And you can kind of see in D, there's another um, contradiction. y equals 4. y equals 4 would be a horizontal line. So that can't be a vertical asymptote. That's a contradiction right there. So C would be the correct answer. And this right here is the definition of vertical asymptote. So if, you, if it says that the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x is infinity, that is the precise definition of a vertical asymptote at x equals 4. Um, for 2, the function g is defined by g of x is equal to that right there. At what values of x does the graph g have a vertical asymptote? So if I'm looking at these answers, it's considering negative 5, 0, and positive 5. So let's see what we get by looking at this expression right here. So considering that out in front we have the absolute value of x minus 5, remember how we can treat that as negative x minus 5 over x minus 5, or we can treat that as x minus 5 over x minus 5. This is going to be for values that are less than 5, and this is going to be for values that are greater than 5. Okay, so... Now, if this could, so it's piecewise function. This is basically just saying that we have a piecewise function. Um, for x is less than 5, that's what it's going to look at, uh, look like out in front. Now, x minus 5 and x minus 5 in either cases is going to cancel. And so that means x equals 5 is not a, um, is not going to be an asymptote because those are removable, right? And if factors cancel, that means that at that x value, that's a removable discontinuity. So I don't think we can have one at 5, so I don't think it's going to be D. So let's look at the, the rest of the expression. Now, you have to know your functions really well in calculus, okay? You have to know the domain restrictions of your functions, okay? You have to know the domain. Uh, it's um, You might have just overlooked domain completely in your algebra classes, but domain is so important in 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 calculus, you you should you're you're going to be expected to know the domain of each type of function. So the natural log, the natural log of x has a domain that x is always going to be greater than zero, not equal to zero, greater than zero. That's the same for log base uh, b of x, anything like that. So knowing that, this expression right here always has to be greater than zero. Now, x squared is always going to be positive, but x plus 5 might be negative, so x plus 5 has to be greater than 0, so x has to be greater than um, uh, negative 5. Uh, 
Now, what's happening at the natural log of x at x equals 0? So on your graph of the natural log, there's an asymptote at x equals 0. So essentially what's happening, uh, what's happening here is that it's being shifted to the left 5. So my graph is over here. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 5. So I know that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 5 because I know the behavior of, nat of the natural log function. So negative 5 is definitely 1. Now let's check for 0. The other thing I need to check here is that I have a rational expression of x plus 5 over x squared, and remember that the denominator cannot equal 0, and there's no factors in this numerator right here that are going to cancel. So that means anything, any non-removable factors in the denominator it means that there is a vertical asymptote, so in this case at x equals 0. So we have two vertical asymptotes, x equals negative 5 and x equals 0. Okay. <clears throat> Um, example three, the values of f of a uh, the values f of x of a function f can be made arbitrarily large. So remember that the values of f of x means the y values, right? So whenever you're thinking about this right here, it says they can, they can be made arbitrarily large. So whenever you're thinking of a graph right here, arbitrarily large values of y means infinity. That's what they mean by um, at arbitrarily large value um, by taking x sufficiently close to 1 so um, but not equal to 1 so what they're saying here if you had a graph of the function f okay at x equals 1 you're right here they're saying that the values of f are going to be really really large okay um, so the values of f of x can be made arbitrarily large by taking x sufficiently close to 1 but not equal to 1. So the values around 1 are going to be made arbitrarily large. I guess I should make <clears throat> that distinction. So the values at x equal 1, we're not sure. But the values really, really close to 1 are going to be made arbitrarily large. So values really, really close to x equals 1, those numbers are going to be really, really, really large. So what right here is this, what um, statement here describes what's happening. So f of 1 does not exist. We don't necessarily know that, and there's nothing stating anything about that. Um, it could exist, but we don't know, okay? We just know values close to 1 are really, really large. We don't know anything about the values at 1. f is continuous at x equals 1. Um, I don't think we can say that either. The limit as x approaches 1 of f of x equals infinity. And I think that's going to be our answer right there. Because um, pretty much what's being described here is just the limit at x equals 1. So um, taking x sufficiently close to 1, that means x approaching 1 but never equal to 1. That's what the, this expression here it means. The limit as x approaches 1 means you're getting values really, really close to 1, but never equal to 1. That's what the, this means. And there's, it's saying of f of x is going to be made arbitrarily large, meaning infinity. Okay? So that's got to be c. Let f be the function defined by f of x equals that right there. For x is greater than 0, which of the following is a horizontal asymptote of the graph of f? Okay, so a horizontal asymptote, let's remember the definition. It's the limit as x approaches infinity or, so I'm going to say positive or negative infinity, of f of x has to be equal to some value not infinity. We'll just say L, I guess, for a limit. So that's what we're going to test here. We're going to find the limit as x approaches positive and negative infinity of this function. Um, only for this, so this function is only for x greater than 0. So I don't care about the limit as x approaches negative infinity. So I'll say the limit as x is approaching infinity of 2 to the x plus 5 over e to the x plus 1. And now we're basically just going to examine the behavior. So as this gets, as x approaches infinity, so as x gets made really, 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 really large, um, what's going to happen? Well, 
these don't really matter. These constant values aren't going to make a difference in that right there. So I'm just going to say that this will be equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 to the x over e to the x. They'll be, they're, they'll be the same because these constant ma uh, values aren't going to make a difference when x is approaching infinity. These are, the difference is negligible. Okay, so um, now I do know that e is equivalent to about 2 point, oh my gosh, I can't remember. One, oh, this is embarrassing. Something, but something around two. I want to say like one eight or one seven. I could be wrong. Or is it two point seven one? I can't remember. In any case, I do know that e is larger than two. So and it's exponential. Both of these are exponential. So at very 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 large um, values of x. Um, that the the magnitude of the denominator will outpace the uh, the values of two to the x, and if that's ever the case, essentially what's going to happen is that this is going to grow very so much faster than this is going to grow, which means the denominator will outpace the numerator, and if that ever happens, the y values are going to get closer to zero as x gets very very large because a very large value divided by a smaller value. Well, a, a very large increasing value versus something that's not increasing as fast will get closer and closer to zero because the numerator is outpacing the denominator. And so if that's the case, this will be equal to zero. We've now found that there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. <clears throat> so that will be a. Okay. Um, and there you go. Um, so we have 5. Let f be the function defined by f of x equals this right here for x is greater than 0. Which of the following is a horizontal asymptote of the graph of f? Okay, we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to say the limit as x approaches infinity, because we're only looking for x greater than 0, of 1 minus 5x minus 2x squared over 3x squared plus 7. Now this is a these are this is a rational function. And so if that's the case for rational function, this makes it really easy. All you really need to know again as x gets really really large, the only terms that matter are the leading terms. The other terms are going to become negligible. So if I take a look at the leading terms, negative 2x squared on top and then 3x squared right here, um, what is this going to be? Well, this is um, going to be equal to negative two thirds. So the values as x gets uh, as x approaches infinity, the values of this function are going to get closer to negative two thirds. So let's say this is negative two thirds right here. So the function is probably going to have some sort of asymptote. I don't know if it's from the top or from the bottom, but yeah, that's where our horizontal asymptote is going to be. <clears throat> All right, for 6, um, let f be a function given by that right there. What are all horizontal asymptotes of the graph of f? All right, same thing what we're going to do here, though, except all horizontal asymptotes. So I'm going to look at negative and positive infinity, okay? Um, so if I do that, let's do the limit as x is approaching. Let's, let's do the left, negative infinity of 1 plus e to the x sine of x over e to the x minus 1 minus 1. And I'm trying to, essentially at this point, I'm trying to think about what's going to be negligible at very large values of x, right? So at very large values of x, sine of 1 alternates between negative 1 and positive 1, but in either case, that's... Um, uh, that, that means that the values of x are just going to be switching between negative and positive 1, essentially, and values in between, right? But in, um, that's really not going to make much of a difference uh, for e to the x. As e to the x gets really, really large, those values are going to get very large, and then you're multiplying it by, you know, at most positive 1, and at least negative 1, um, if that makes sense. So this is kind of 
negligible at very large values of x is what I'm saying. And so is 1, or, or adding 1 to it, if, if that makes sense. Um, uh, oof, wait a second, though. I have to, to think about this for a little bit because we're using negative infinity. So, okay. Um, so if we're using negative infinity, that's not going to change this right here. So if we're looking at values to the left right here, so pretty much infinitely small values, that's not going to change because even to the on the left side of sine of x, it's still going to alternate between positive 1 and negative 1. So that's not going to change. But e to the x, um, that might be uh, different because so if you think about the graph of e to the x, so it's going to look like this right here, right? So what is happening to e to the x for very, very uh, infinitely small values as you approach negative infinity, you see that e actually gets closer and closer and closer to zero. Okay, okay, so good thing I noticed that. So in that case, if this right here, if for infinitely negative values, of x, this is actually going to become 0, and this is going to become 0, so my numerator is going to look more like 1. Okay, so I'm going to say 1 over, now if I look at uh, infinitely negative values here, so, uh, hmm, that right there, so um, if I think about e to the so for very, very small values of e to the x minus 1, well, e to the x minus 1 um, is going to look very, very similar to e to the x. This is just the same thing as e to the x, but shifted to the right one. But in any case, for very, very small values, um, essentially what's going to happen is that this right here is going to become 0. Okay? And so then we're just going to get negative 1. Right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so then in this case right here, this will be just equal to negative 1. Okay, yeah, I think that's that should be right. Yep, yep. Um, okay, so that means there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative 1. Okay, let's try the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus e to the x sine of x over e to the x minus 1 minus 1. Okay, now we're looking at infinitely large values of x. What's happening to e to the x at infinitely large values? It's getting very, very, very large, right? And then sine of x, just basically, it's just going to bounce between negative 1 and 1, and that's not going to make a difference when you're multiplying it by very, very large values. And then you're adding 1, that's not going to make a difference, so all of this is just going to become very, very, very large, right? And then here we have e to the x minus 1, same thing here. This is going to become very, very large. It's going to become, there. it's very similar to e to the x, okay, um, minus 1. Um, so in this case, where both right here are just getting very, very large, essentially, I think this should just become infinity right here, which means that the limit does not exist right here. And so I think the only horizontal asymptote that we have is going to be um, neg uh, y equals negative 1. So should be negative 1 only. Okay. Um, so for 7... Um, Let's see, so we have a table. The table above gives values of a function g at select values of x. Which of the following statements, if true, would be sufficient to conclude that there exists a number c in the interval from 0 to 7 such that g of c is equal to 50? So I think here we're using the intermediate value theorem. So if you don't know what that is, pull out your notes, look at it, okay? Basically what it's saying so we have values of g, which of the following statements, if true, would be sufficient to conclude? So intermediate value theorem. We need to make sure that the conditions are met. And the conditions of the intermediate value theorem basically say that um, g has to be continuous. So g is continuous on the interval, on interval from a to b, we'll say. And I think that might be the only condition that we need. So if G is continuous on the interval from A to B, then 
Um, there has to exist every value from f of uh, a to um, f of b. So, okay. So which of the following statements, if true, would be sufficient to conclude that there is a value c on the interval from 0 to 7 such that g of c is equal to 50? Okay, so you guys agree that 50 is somewhere between here and here. So is there a value of c contained here where you would get an output of 50? And we just basically need to make sure that g is continuous. So g is defined for all x in the interval. That's talking about the x values right there. Um, that kind of sounds like it's saying it's continuous, but I think there's a difference, but I can't think of what the difference is. Um, increasing, that's not true. Uh, this is, this has got to be three only. Um, I think that there's a difference between being defined. I can't think of it right now, but in any case, I think it should just be three only. That's the only thing that should matter. All right, so for eight, um, select values of a continuous function f are given in the table above. What is the fewest possible number of zeros of f on the interval from negative two to three? So this is still following the intermediate value theorem. We do know that the f is continuous. So if I'm looking at the y values, so the y values here go from negative two to five. And so if it's continuous uh, during this interval right here, um, I'm just realizing the difference between um, being defined and continuous because you can still be defined and not continuous here. So kind of just going back here. So that doesn't matter. That's why it just needs to be continuous. Um, sorry, just kind of thought about that. Um, in, in any case, so if we're continuous right here, then um, from negative 2 to 5, that means some value of x in between here has to give me an output of 0. Okay, So here is one instant right there. And then, again, here, we have y values from 2 to negative 4. And if we're continuous, there has to be a value in between here that's going to give me a y value of 0. Okay, So there's another instant. Um, and then, again, here, so from negative 1 to 3, at some point, there ha the, the value of the function has to be 0. So what is the fewest possible number of zeros? There has to be at least 3. Could there be more? Yes, but that's what the graph tells us what there could be. That there has to be at least. Okay. Um, here we have a calculator one. Let f be the function given by f of x. Okay. The intermediate value theorem applied to f on the closed interval um, 24 to 28 guarantees a solution 24 to 28. Which of the following? A, um, which of the of to which of the following equations? Okay. So. I see this right here. I see a complicated function. I'm going to graph this, um, and I'm probably going to want to use a, a table. So we'll go to y equals, let me clear this right here. So we have um, uh, 9 plus 2, and then we have x, and then we have e raised to the um, negative x, divided by 4 and then this right here is going to be all over cosine of x divided by 2 oh no that's still in my um that's got to drop there we go divided by, and then we're going to have cosine of x divided by 2. All right, so um, one second. Um, excuse me. Um, I need to adjust my window, though. I Let's see what I need. So I need to adjust my window to include values um, between 24 and 20. Eight. Um, so if I go here, go to my window, my x minimum, I mean, if that's the only thing I care about, I'm going to do like 23. And then here I'm going to do like 29. And I go to graph. Um, I'm probably going to need to adjust my window size. Well, okay, let me go back here. Um, 
so looking at the y values oof we have a lot of y values so i'm going to and we want to check from zero to i'm going to put up to 80. okay so i'm going to go for my y values if i go to my window go to my minimum here i'll keep that at negative 10 but i want to change my y to be at uh, most 80. okay um now i'm also just going to check my table so i think that's more important so if I go down to x equals 24, so x equals 24, you can see that y will be equal to 10.806. Oh, I don't know what just happened. One second. There we go. So when x is equal to 24, y is equal to 10.806. Now, let's go back here. Let's go to uh, 28. So at 28, we're 66.193. So uh, 66.193 when x is equal to 28. Okay. So um, the intermediate value theorem applied to f on a closed interval guarantees. So basically, the function is continuous. So if this is the case, then there has to be a val the the function has to take on every value in between these two values right here so zero is not in this in here neither is nine neither so 12 is 12.235 is the only value that's in between here so there has to be some value in this interval that will give me that so c would be the correct answer all right looks like we got some free response questions all right, um, again, none of this is really too uh, helpful. Uh, I guess it depends, but... All right, so let f be the function defined above, and k is a constant. All right, for what value of k, if any, is f continuous at x equals negative 3? So this is going back to the previous lesson. But so for what values of k, if any, um, is f continuous at x equals negative 3? So I'm going to plug in negative 3. But I really only care about negative 3 here and negative 3 here. So for A, we're going to do, it's going to be um, 2 times by negative 3 squared. If I plug in negative 3, it's going to be minus 15 minus 3 over um, negative 3K plus 1 half. Let's just simplify that. That's going to be 18. Um, that can be minus 18. You know what I'm thinking I should do first? I think I should factor. <laughs> um, make this a little bit easier on me. So if I factor the numerator, uh, that's going to be 2x. That's got to be x. And now 3 and 5. So that's got to be, um, uh, I want to say minus 3. No, it's got to be plus 3. And then that's got to be minus 1. Okay, and then on the denominator, we're going to have x um, plus 3 and x plus 1. Those cancel. Sweet. And then we got uh, 2x minus 1 over x plus 1. Um, okay, so if I plug in negative 3 here, if I plug in negative 3 here, that's going to become negative 7 over negative 2, so 7 halves. Okay, so um, this function right here, good thing I canceled those because there's a removable discontinuity at x equals negative 3 for that one. So that means this function right here has to be equal to 7 halves when x is equal to negative 3. So if I plug in negative 3 there, that's going to be negative 3k plus 1 half. That has to be equal to 7 halves because that's what this function is going towards, but not equal to. So then um, if I subtract a half, so subtract one half from that, I'm going to get negative 3k is equal to, that's going to become 3, right? And then divide by negative 3, so k will be equal to negative 1. Um, what is my justification for that? justify your answer so the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left of f of x is equal to 7 halves right um 
and then that means, and then the limit as x approaches negatively from the right of f of x is also equal to 7 halves if, let me say this, and, yeah, that's equal to, so, and f of um, negative 3 is equal to 7 halves if k is equal to negative 1. That's my justification there. Okay, for B, what type of discontinuity does f have at x equals 0? So we're looking at x equals 0. What's happening there? So we can... Um, Okay, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. um, I'm mainly looking right here at x equals 0 because I'm noticing a ratio. Okay, so let's, let's just evaluate the, the limit. So the limit as x approaches um, infinity, okay... No, sorry, as x approaches 0, because we're evaluating it at 0. So the limit as x approaches 0 of the expression 2 to the x over 3 to the x minus 1. Now, this is negligible when we're approaching very large values. That's not going to make a difference in this expression right here. So that's going to be equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of 2 to the x over 3 to the x. Now, because... Uh, this right here, so in uh, this case right here, um, this is essentially going to become equal to zero, right? Um, let me think about this right here. So the limit as x approaches, no, no, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not, pro I'm, I'm getting mixed up at where we're approaching. So the limit as x approaches zero, not infinity. The limit as x approaches 0 from the right, and I only want to evaluate it from the right because we're talking about the right side. So this function right here is a linear function, right? And so from the left side of x equals 0, it has to be approaching kind of like at this sort of way or this sort of way, depending on the value of k, right? So I don't, so it can't be like, so it's got to be approaching in that sort of way at x equals 0, right, if that makes sense. Now, from the right side, because of this expression, I am pretty much, just based off my knowledge of function, going to assume that it's probably going to be an asymptote because it doesn't really seem like... Um, it's, just, it's a rational expression, so my guess is that at x equals 0, there's probably an asymptote. So that's why I'm, I'm checking the limit at x equals 0 from the right side of... We got 2 to the x over 3 to the x minus 1, right? Um, so, uh, let's think about this. Man, I really wish we knew L'Hopital's rule right now because that would be so much easier to evaluate this limit. But I'm trying to think of how we would want to evaluate this limit for you guys right here. Well, um, I do know... Neither of these is going to equal, well, okay, so, well, let's think about 2 to the x, right? So if you think about 2 to the x, that's what it's going to look like. So the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of 2 to the, 2 to the x, I can just plug in 0 right there. And 2 to the 0 is just going to be 1, right? So it's going to be 1 over, and then, okay, here we go. Yep, 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 this is what we want to do. Okay, so then if I plug in 0 here, that's going to be 3 to the 0, my, uh, and that's going to be 1, so 1 minus 1. So that will be 1 over 0. And we, we talked about it in class. If you get this expression from here, from a limit, what what that means is that um, your, your function is approaching either positive infinity or negative infinity. Okay, so in this case, how can you tell if it's positive or negative? So what I'm going to do, since I'm only talking about the right side, so let's go ahead and do, um, let's say that if I were to evaluate this function right here, let's say we want to do f of 0 
one or something like that right there, okay? Something very, very close to zero to the right of zero, but not equal to. So if I do that, um, what do I get? So um, if you wanted to use a calculator for this, it should just always be positive, right? Okay, so then in this case, the top is going to be positive, right? And the bottom, if you're not sure, so if I did something like this right here, so second quit, if I did three raised to the point zero 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 one, this is going to be something funky. Okay, so that's something really, really close to one, but not exactly one, right? So because we know that three to the zero is going to be one. Three, um, but this right here isn't quite zero. It's something a little bit greater than zero. So that means this will be just a little bit larger than one and one minus one, something a little bit larger than one minus one. That's still going to be positive. So this has to be positive infinity. So, um, so the limit as x approaches zero from the right of two to the x over three to the x minus one is going to be equal to positive infinity okay which means going back um what type of discontinuity um vertical asymptote so vertical asymptote because that right there all right um for c find all horizontal asymptotes of the graph of f Show the work that leads to your answer. Find all horizontal asymptotes. Oof. Okay, so the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is going to be equal to. Now, I'm only going to look at this side right here um, for that because this is the graph that exists for negative infinity, right? And because we have a rational expression, all that matters is what's happening for the leading terms at negative infinity. So there's going to be a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2 because that's uh, the coefficients of those terms. So that's going to be equal to 2. So y equals 2. And then the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, so that means we're looking at uh, this one right here. So as x values get really, really large, it's going to be equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 to the x over 3 to the x um, uh, minus 1. So right here, um, this is negligible for large values of x. 2 to the x is going to be very, very large, but 3 to the x is going to be even more large. The magnitude is that of that is going to be greater because 3 is larger. So exponentially, this will increase faster than this one right here. And if that's the case, the values will get closer to 0. So y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. And we did show our work. We showed our, our limits at infinity and negative infinity. OK. Let's see if we can hurry up and do this. I want to be done. <laughs> um, let's see. So we have R of t um, given here. The total accumulated revenue a uh, company has received up to time t is modeled by the function r defined above, where r of t is measured in millions of United States dollars, and t um, is modeled by the function... Uh, sorry, I'm not paying attention to what I'm reading. I'm looking at something else, too. <laughs> um, the total accumulated revenue of a company uh, has received up to time t is modeled by the function r defined above, where r of t is measured in millions of the... Um, United States dollars. Okay, so find the limit. Uh, okay, easy enough. So if we're looking for uh, t approaches infinity of r t, all that matters is this part right here. So the limit as t approaches infinity of one hundred t squared plus one thousand over t squared plus six hundred. Um. Okay, so this is a rational expression. These constants aren't going to matter for values greater than that right there. Okay, and then so all that matters are the leading terms. So we have t squared, t squared. Those are going to cancel, leaving me to be just 100. So that should just be 100. So there you go. Explain the meaning. Okay, so t is going to be time, correct? Um, time in years since 1980. So as 
the years increase past 1980, what does R of T mean? Millions, measured millions of U.S. dollars is going to be. So this is 100. So what this means right here is that as time increases, um, increases, how do you spell? Is that going to be with a, a C uh, or an S? Increases. Sure. Um, as time increases, um, the revenue the revenue um, will approach 100 million US dollars. Okay. Is the function R continuous at T equals 20? So um, the limits have to be the same from the left and from the right. And then uh, the function has to be the same. So let's do that. So B, we're going to do the limit as, as T approaches 20 from the left of R of T. Okay, so that's going to be looking at, at this function right here. So can I plug in 20? Yes, I can. That's going to be equal to 40. 1 square root of 20 over 20. That's going to just be equal to 41. Now, let's do the limit as t approaches uh, 20 from the right of r of t. So that's looking at this side at 20. Can I plug in 20 in there? Let's try it. So we have 100 times by 20 squared plus 1,000 over 20 squared plus 600. Okay, 20 squared is 400, right? Plus 1,000 over 400 plus 600. Let's see how good my arithmetic is. That's going to be 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 1, 2, 3, over. Um, that's going to be uh, 1,000, right? Okay, and then that's going to be equal to 41,000 over 1,000. Isn't that just going to be 4? Yep, that's equal to 41. Okay, so the limit from the left is 41. The limit from the right is 41. Also, the function r of t is 41 because we just plugged in 41 um, for the right side and got the same thing. And so I'll say that right there. We'll say r of 20 is equal to 41. Yes, um, r is continuous at x equals 20. And we just uh, stated all of this information here to provide... Um, our justification. Oh my gosh, why is C looking so long? Okay, um, the company's total accumulated expenses up to time t is modeled by the function e defined given here. How is this not a calculator problem? All right, um, defined by that. It is measured in millions of US dollars, okay? Um, since 1980, up to, oh, okay. So R of T, time in here, since 1980. So this function represents the, the revenue of the U.S. dollars, K, okay, that this company has received since 1980. But prior to 1980, the company's total accumulated expenses up to time T is modeled by this equation, where T is measured in millions of dollars, K. Okay, and you, uh, wait, oh, wait, no, 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 no accumulated expenses so r of t is going to be revenue e of t is the accumulated expenses okay of course sorry i should probably do a better job of it, explaining these <laughs> hopefully you guys aren't getting lost while i'm trying to figure this out okay according to these models um there is a time t from zero to five at which the total accumulated profit r of t minus e of t is e is there a time is there a time where R of T minus E is equal to zero? Okay. Um, uh, this is uh, going. This is using the um, the intermediate value theorem. So basically, what we need to find um, here is uh, we need to test the endpoints. So what we want to do is do R. Of, oops. So for C. 
r of 0 minus e of 0, what is this going to be equal to? And what is r of, of 5 minus e of 5? So that's what we, we want to find. And then if, um, basically, if we can find that if 1 is negative and 1 is positive, because these are continuous functions over this interval right here, that means we can state that at some point the, the revenue minus the accumulative expensive must be equal to 0. So r of 0, that's going to be defined here. So what is this going to be um, in this case right here? So r of 0 is going to be equal to 0. Okay, that's going to be equal to 0 minus, what is e of 0? So if I plug in 0 here, oh man, it's making me do some, some algebra with logarithms. So we have 3 log base 2 of 4. Okay, so um, if t is 0 right there, that's going to go away, right? And then you can think about the, you guys probably aren't going to remember these log rules. Okay, 2 squared, correct? So that's because this right here is 4. Now, in this case, log base 2 of 2, that cancels, leaving me with just 2 right here being multiplied by 3. So this is going to be equal to 6. So 0 minus 6, this is going to be equal to negative 6. Now, if I can show that r of 5 minus e of 5 is greater than 0, then that means at some point um, between 0 and 5, this would have to be equal to 0. Okay? Um, so what is r of 5? So that's going to be in here. So if I plug in 5, that's going to be 41 times by the square root of 5 over 20, which is the same thing as the square 41 times by the square root of 1 fourth, which is the same thing as 41 times by 1 half. So 41 over 2. All right, we're getting some fractions. Nice. All right, and now here, if I plug in 5 here, oh, man, what is 12 times by 5 is um, 12 times by uh, 5? Is that 60? And then plus 4, so that's going to be 64. So we're going to have 3 log base 2 of 64. That's the same thing as 3 log base 2 of uh, 60. Four. That's the same. Okay, I'm trying to do my powers of 2. I want to get something with a base 2. Isn't that 2 to the 6? Because 2 to, two to the 4th is um, 16. So 2 to the 5th is 32. 2 to the 6th is 64. Those cancel. That's going to give me 3 times 6. That's going to give me 18. Okay, so then... Um, that right there is going to be minus 18. Now, 41 over 2 minus, if I, that's going to be the same thing as 36 over 2. In any case, that is going to be a positive number. So because I have a negative 6 here, and from 0 to 5, this jumps to something that's positive, at some point, since there, these functions are continuous from 0 to 5, there has to be something equal to 0. Okay? So, um... You'd have to say by some sort of by intermediate value theorem, uh, yes, there has to be um, it, r of t minus e of t must equal zero. So we'll say that r of t minus e of t has to be equal to zero um, between um, zero and five, right? Yep. Okay, um, so I think this one was a little bit longer. Sorry if my explanations went on a bit. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at these questions and figuring it out as I go as well. So hopefully um, that's okay with you guys. Um, but if not, please just let me know when you come to class or at some point, okay? This is really okay. <laughs>